Dear congregation, Jesus Christ, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, proclaimed a particular message to seven churches in Asia. And we have seen that each of these messages focused on one particular quality that churches also today should emulate. Ephesian church is exhorted to return to its first fresh love to Christ. Smyrnian church is warned that if she does not compromise the truth, she will suffer persecution for Christ's sake. The Pergamus truth is church is, is called to champion truth in the face of error. And then we saw that the church in Thyatira is admonished to follow righteousness in the midst of evil. And the Sardis church must strive for inward reality behind the church's outward show. The Philadelphia church is encouraged to walk through the open door set before her. But the Lord's strongest words, his strongest rebuke, is reserved for the Laodicean church, who must abandon her lukewarmness and must live wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ and his cause. And it's to that rebuke that we turn this morning in Revelation 3, 14 through 22. I'll read again at this moment only verses 15 and 16. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. With God's help, we want to look at Christ's message to a lukewarm church. Christ's message to a lukewarm church. I have just two thoughts this morning. First, Christ's disgust. And second, Christ's remedy. Christ's disgust and Christ's remedy. Laodicea was located some 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. It was the main city of the southern region of Phrygia. It was known for four things, all four of which, by the way, are hinted at in Christ's message to Laodicea. First of all, it was a place of hot springs. So Laodicea knew very well what the symbolism of lukewarm water meant. Second, it was a place of medicine, particularly a center for eye salve to cure eye diseases. Third, It was a place famous for its soft black wool that was woven into luxurious garments. A fourth, the obvious one, it was a very wealthy city. Lots of high-class bankers and finance people and businessmen. In fact, Laodicea was so rich that when much of the city was destroyed by an earthquake in A.D. 60, The government offered emergency assistance, but Laodicea spurned it. They said, we can handle it ourselves. And that was both the strength and the weakness of Laodicea, that Laodicea was self-sufficient, independent. She could do things on her own. She didn't need help from anyone. Now when whoever came, we don't know, but planted the Laodicean church there, the church became infected by 90 AD at least, when John wrote these words, with the surrounding problem in Laodicea. So the church itself became infected with this problem of self-complacency, self-sufficiency, self 
self-satisfaction, self-righteousness. In fact, the Laodicean church became so self-complacent, so content with going through the church motions, so content with their formal, nominal Christianity, that Jesus actually doesn't have one word to praise her. And all the other letters, you could almost feel that Jesus sometimes almost bends over backwards to find a, a way to compliment a church before he rebukes her and corrects her. But here there's just nothing of complimentary nature at all. This is the strongest, sternest letter. And you almost get the feeling that that's what it's going to be when you hear the very name of Jesus as he comes to Laodicea in verse 14. He says that he is the amen. That is, the one who's always certain and true, whose words are always reliable. The amen, as someone has said, is actually a verbal seal in an oral society. Later on, seals would be made in wax. But in an or oral society, the amen, I certainly vow that this is true, is a verbal seal. Jesus is saying, as he introduces this letter to the church of Laodicea, and you can just envision the church gathered to hear the letter, and the first thing they hear is, this comes from him who is the amen. That every word of this letter is absolutely certain and sure. And that is reinforced by the next name, the faithful and true witness, by which Jesus means to say not only is his word always true, but there's neither error nor hypocrisy. He's a faithful witness. This word is true. This word he's about to bring them is well meant. It's sincere even though it will hurt. And then this strange title, the beginning of the creation of God. Actually, the word in Greek can mean the ruler of creation. It means that, as John says in his gospel, in the beginning was the word. He was there at the beginning. He was the ruler of creation. There is none before him. There is none above him. His word is a final word. He knows of what he speaks. Laodicea, listen to the amen. Listen to the true and faithful witness. Listen to the beginning of the creation of God. And then comes the rebuke. I know, verse 15, thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Hot and cold, of course, are extremes, and that's what Jesus meant to say. Something can be boiling hot, something can be freezing cold. Something that's lukewarm is neither hot nor cold. It's not totally one thing or totally another thing. It's a mixture. And you see Christ is describing here a form of Christian life, a, a form of Christian commitment, of Christian conviction that never becomes wholehearted. It's always mixed with the world. It's a lukewarm thing, a non-zealous thing. Laodicean Christianity had lost its clarity, its enthusiasm, its Christ-centered zeal. It was far from where Paul was when Paul said, I count all things but loss and dung that I may know Christ and win him and know the power of his resurrection. You see, this single-mindedness, this wholeheartedness, this out-and-out -out commitment to Christ and the gospel was missing in Laodicea. Now today, of course, it's missing in many churches and we need to ask ourselves, is it present in our church as well? So many today say, well, to be zealous is just to be emotional. It's, it's to be fanatic. We don't want this kind of wholehearted zeal. But of course, that's, that's foolishness. There is, there is such a thing as fanaticism. Fanaticism is 
wholehearted conviction for something, divorce from the word of God. But real zeal is wholehearted commitment tethered to the word of God, tethered to Jesus Christ. Fanaticism is a mindless form of wholeheartedness where the heart runs away from the head and the head runs away from the heart. But true wholeheartedness is where head and heart and hands are seamlessly one piece, as it were, and they co-labor with the Holy Spirit for the cause and the kingdom of Jesus Christ with a single eye, his name to glorify. And that's what Jesus misses in Laodicea. That's what grieves him. Yes, more. That's what disgusts him. He's disgusted with Laodicea. He's sickened by Laodicea. Why? Why does lukewarmness, may I just say it bluntly the way the Bible actually says it here, why does lukewarmness make Jesus sick? Want to spew Laodicea out of his mouth. Actually, the idea is actually spit her out. Why does Jesus respond so despicably to this church that has apparently a pretty good reputation. Well, let me give you three reasons. The first is this. Jesus despises all self-complacency and half-hearted religion. As I was going over my notes this morning, my tea became lukewarm. And I couldn't drink any more of it. You know what that's like. You want your tea hot or you want iced tea. You don't, you don't want something in between. And that's the way it is spiritually with Jesus. He doesn't want a church that's a halfway house of Christianity a merger between church and world. It's as if Jesus says to Laodicea, you are trying to have me and my spiritual riches in one arm while you embrace the world and its riches with your other arm. And the result is tragic, disgusting Christianity because it's lukewarm and self-righteous. It's limp. It's lacking zeal. You do the right things, but where's your heart? Now, in our affluent age, in our worldly age, we are in grave danger of picking up this Laodicean spirit. How easy it is for a church today to lose its zeal for God, to stop searching the scriptures with hunger, to stop drinking in truth, to stop hating sin, to stop living for Christ, to see no real beauty in the Savior or in holiness, to feel no need to pour itself out in earnest prayer before God. A lukewarm church is a church where no one or very few are taking hold of God and taking the kingdom of heaven by violence. There's no earnestness. There's no passion. There's complacent self-righteousness. There's no conviction Without me, you can do nothing. The Laodicean church members are impacted by the spirit of the world around them. They liked being a little bit religious. They had enough religion to try to pacify their conscience, but their heart was back in the world. They had no self-knowledge. They said, we're, we're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. And they didn't know that they were wretched and blind and poor and miserable and naked. And you see, Jesus hates this. He hates their attitude. He's grieved by it. He's disgusted by it. He says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Many ways, they're like the Pharisees. 
You know, Jesus couldn't stand the Pharisees, could he? Because there was such hypocrisy. They, he'd tell people where to go, and they wouldn't walk a step in that direction. They had all the religion outwardly, but they didn't have it in their heart. And so he begins this letter, after he gives them his name, he says, I know thy works. You think you know yourself, and you think other churches know you, and you have a good reputation of yourself, and they have a good reputation of you, but I know you. I x-ray your innermost being, and I see your hypocrisy. I know your lukewarmness. I see your external activity and your lack of internal reality. There's something tra tragic about you, Laodicea. You're a sham. You're a pretense. You're hypocritical. You have a let's pretend religion. Oh, how easy that is to do. Especially if you've been brought up in a religious home. How our hearts want to pretend. Even after we receive grace. That's what backsliding is all about. We, 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 we backslide back into a kind of let's pretend religion. We're not real sinners. Let's pretend we're, well, we pretend we're real sinners, but we're really not real sinners. If someone challenges us, challenges us on something, we, we get very defensive. We want to pretend when we look at our neighbors, we're, we're not as bad as they are. We want to pretend when we hear others talk so glibly about Christ and salvation that we too can somehow take Jesus to ourselves without needing the application of the Holy Spirit. And God and his truth and his son are not burning, vibrant realities in our lives. What about you, my friend, this morning? I'm not asking you if you're a perfect or even a mature Christian, but I'm asking you, is there a holy zeal in your life for the cause of God? Is Jesus Christ really number one? Is there a passion? Is there a singleness of mind, a wholehearted conviction that you want to live for him and die for him? Are you dedicated to Christ and to his church, to his bride, to this church? Or is religion kind of like an appendix to your life? Something you go to for a break on Sunday. You, you come to church as an appendix to your week. But your real, your real life is out there in the work world and you can't wait for Monday to get, get back to work. Or You have a form religion. And you live on and on and on, lukewarm. You never really become lost. You never really become saved. You never really miss the Lord on the one hand. And you never really find him on the other hand. And somehow you kind of float along, semi-religious. Jesus hates that. He's disgusted with that. He says, I'm about to spew you out of your mouth. It's like lukewarm tea. I, I can't take it anymore. Secondly, Jesus doesn't only hate lukewarm religion, but... Lukewarm religion is the greatest insult you can pay him. Think of it this way. Perhaps you're a housewife, and it's your, just say it's your husband's birthday this week, and you, you fix him his favorite meal when he's gone at work, and you've, you've, gone, well, you've gone to the store, you've got all the ingredients, you, 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 you come home, you cook up a storm, so by the time he gets home, you've got this most beautiful meal all ready for him. Um, maybe, maybe you even make it a candlelit dinner and you, maybe you even send the kids away and it's just the two of you. Uh, it's just very, very special. Well, what would you think if he comes in and he just eats the meal like you made him scramble eggs? And he goes off into the living room, grabs the newspaper, doesn't say a word to you, doesn't thank you. You'd be insulted, wouldn't you? And you just made one meal, three, four hours of work. How do you think Christ feels when he came from heaven to save you, came to suffer and die for you, agonized for you, became an object of shame for you, hung naked on the cross for you, poured out his life blood for you, cried out the cry of dereliction for you, 
My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you come to church from Sunday to Sunday and you hear the gospel and you shrug it off. And you take him for granted. Take him for granted. Take his blood for granted. What an insult to be lukewarm toward a savior who gave us all for you. It's tragedy. It's spiritual insanity. How could we ever be lukewarm with such a gospel? Jesus hates it. He's disgusted with it. And then thirdly, think of the way in which your lukewarmness and mine affects the reputation of Christ in this world. You know, there's such a thing as guilt by association. As a Christian, you, you can't be associated, can you, with certain things. By belonging, you're guilty. And sometimes Christ has to reluctantly withdraw himself from a church for his, for his own good name's sake, because the church is so, so lukewarm. And the church is doing damage to his name and reputation because of this lukewarmness. And I know, of course, we try to reason it all the way. I do too, with, with theology. We say things like this, well, but we're not in heaven yet. We're, we, we, the old nature is still with us. The flesh has a powerful influence on us. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Uh, can't help it that I'm so lukewarm. My old nature is in conflict with my new. You see, but the world doesn't understand our theology. The world looks at your life. The world, the man in the street doesn't know about flesh, spirit, dichotomy, or old nature versus new nature. He just looks at you and says, if that's Christianity, there's nothing to it. Where is the zeal if you believe it? The world is sometimes more zealous with its empty agenda than we are with the truth, the way, and the life. The world can look at us and say, well, if, if you really believe in hell and you're my neighbor, why have you never warned me to flee from the wrath to come? Why have you never come over to my house and spoken to me with tears about the reality of hell? You don't really believe it. You're lukewarm. Perhaps you've heard of a well-known story especially in the, the UK, about a man named Charlie Peace who was on his way to the gallows uh, in the 16th century when he overheard an Anglican minister reading rather matter-of-factly from the Book of Common Prayer about eternity and heaven and hell. And, and Charlie turned to the minister and said, Man, if I believed what you and the church of God say you believe, even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it if needs be on hands and knees and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from an eternal hell if hell is like that. The greatest stumbling block we put in front of unbelievers in this world is our own lukewarmness. Do we believe what we say we believe? And if it doesn't come out of our mouths, it doesn't show with the passion of our lives, it doesn't ring true to the world. And there comes a point where Christ has to withdraw himself to, to the outer fringe of the church and stand at the door outside and knock, asking that he would come in again and be revived again. There comes a point sometimes where Christ can't associate with us, has to withdraw from us because of our despicable lukewarmness. He says, I'll spew you. I'll spit you out of my mouth. And the Greek 
The Greek tense here implies an imminent action. I'm just about to do it. It can happen any minute. I'm tired of your lukewarmness. I'm disgusted with how many years you've gone on sitting in the church pew, lukewarm. Laodicea, wake up. Laodicea, repent. Repent. My patience is nearly at an end. You almost see this, almost, it's almost like a dichotomy within Christ as he speaks to Laodicea, don't you? You see this one side of Christ, he just can't stand it anymore. He's ready to spit them out of his mouth. And on the other side, he can't quite leave them. He stands at the door of the church and knocks. It's like he wants to give them one more opportunity. He reminds you of the fig tree, doesn't it? Dig a dung about it one more year to see if it will bear fruit. Well, but if not, then cast it to the ground. And so the first part of this letter is very blunt, isn't it? It's very, very stern. Christ is showing us his disgust. But then the rest of the letter is soft. It's encouraging. It's, it's pleading. It provides a remedy, a, a glorious remedy. Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. This is actually absolutely phenomenal. He's picking up on the three things Laodicea is famous for in the natural realm, and he's saying, I've got all three of those things in the spiritual realm for you. And I counsel you to buy it of me. Actually, what he does in the rest of this letter is he, it's like a diamond, and he turns the diamond in four different facets. He says, here's four different ways. Use all four ways, and you'll find a remedy for your disgusting lukewarmness. The first remedy is buy of Christ. Buy of Christ. Now, we can't read too much theology here and say, well, uh, we, can, we can buy salvation. That's, of course, not what the Lord meant. But Laodicea was a city of buying and selling, you see, a city of marketplaces. It's so, as if the Lord says, I, I, I'm coming into your marketplace, and I'm standing in your market, and I'm saying, I'm doing what, what, what I've done in the Old Testament to, to Israel in, in Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, come ye in. Buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come buy of me. But there's also something interesting about this word buy. The root word in Greek for the word buy here actually means an exchange. You buy by exchange. You, well, because we do that all the time, still, we exchange money and we buy something. Or better yet, the picture is you exchange something with someone else. They give you something, and you give them something in return. And what the Lord is saying is, Laodicea, exchange your artificial riches that you possess for my real riches. Exchange your self-righteousness for my righteousness. Exchange your sins for my holiness. I am the great exchange. Buy of me. I have everything you need. Laodicea, my opinion of you is 180 degrees different than your opinion. You think you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I tell you, you're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But the good news is, if you buy of me, I'll take over your poverty, your misery, your blindness, and your nakedness, and I'll give you the real riches. Buy of me. Lose, Laodicea, your ability to make medicine for eyes to think that you can see and learn to buy of me, I salve, that you may truly see. 
Lose your ability to make your fancy clothes for which your city is famous and buy of me my white-robed righteousness. Lose your gold and riches and buy of me true gold tried in the fire. Laodicea. Of me, those four letters really is your answer, your remedy for your disgusting lukewarmness. Everything you need is of me. Come to me. Come to me first for Isav. Isav is symbolic, of course, of regeneration. Remember the, the, the blind man in John 9. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. The Lord's, Lord's beginning to work in him, a new life. He's, he's regenerated, born again, quickened from the dead. White raiment. That has always been a symbol, hasn't it, of justification. The righteousness of Christ. Buy it of me. Come to me for it. Without money and without price. I can regenerate you and justify you. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds and these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. That's what you need. And gold, tried in the fire. Symbol, of course, of sanctification. Christ himself was that golden Savior who went through golden trials. The Bible speaks often of Gold in the symbol of trial. Saints are to be tried like gold, says Zechariah. You find it also in the book of Job. And First Peter says, the trial of faith is more precious than gold. Well, Jesus said, I'm your golden Savior. Come to me. Exodus 25, Christ is represented by the ark, of which it is said, Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it. And thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. You see, that's Christ. He's gold within. He's gold around. He's gold without. He's gold round about. If you want to be sanctified, you have to come to him. If you want to be regenerated, you come to him. If you want to be justified, you come to him. Laodicea, I am everything. I'll regenerate you with my eyes salve. I'll justify you with my white raiment. I'll sanctify you with gold tried in the fire. So the first remedy is buy of Christ. The second remedy is respond to Christ. Verse 20. Christ comes knocking on the doors of his church and on the hearts of sinners. But before we go further, let's sing. Psalter 125, 1 through 4. O royal bride, give heed. 125, 1 through 4.
Jesus Christ said John Bunyan is a knocking savior. He knocks with invitations. He knocks in love. He knocks sincerely. He knocks earnestly. He knocks with judgments. He knocks with afflictions. He knocks with sicknesses. He knocks with death. He knocks every day on the door of our lives. He knocks in small problems. He knocks in big tragedies. He follows us and knocks on our way, knocks on our doors every day. But what does he mean when he says, I stand at the door and knock? If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. There's been a lot of different interpretations of this text. Basically, I think we can say three things about it. The first is, Christ is knocking at the door of the Laodicean church as a corporate congregation. The message is coming to the church as a whole. Christ is disgusted with this church. And yet he hasn't abandoned her. He's outside their worship. He's outside their preaching. He's not the center of the sermons. He's outside their ministries. He's outside their evangelism. He's been marginalized by the church. And so he cannot abide to be in the midst of them. He's disgusted with them. He's ready to spew them out of his mouth. But he stands at the door and knocks. And says, if any man, anyone in that church, hears my voice and will return to me, I will not abandon you yet. I haven't gone away yet. I'm not a thousand miles away. I'm at your door. I'm knocking at your door. But don't go on being lukewarm. Then the second application comes to individual believers within the church of Laodicea. And that's specifically mentioned here. He's not just knocking to the church as a whole, but the church is made up of individual believers. Behold, I stand at the door and knock if any man, singular, if anyone in this church hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What a glorious thing that is. Those of you who are true believers and know what it means to have Jesus Christ, as it were, by his spirit come into your soul and conquer you and give you wholehearted commitment to himself and cause you to fall out of love with yourself and into love with him so that he becomes your object, your desire, your zeal, and you become a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a teenager with a single-minded vision. And he comes to sup with you. Your heart will burn within you like the travelers to Emmaus when he breaks bread in the way. You will be amazed. You will cry out, oh, abide with us. Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us? And when he sat down and broke bread in our midst, was there not sacred communion and intimacy that wedded our hearts unto him? My friend, do you know anything of that sacred communion, that supping with Jesus, not just in the Lord's Supper, but also in the experience of your soul? communion, fellowship. It's like being around a table and having a wonderful time of fellowship with someone around a meal. That's how a believer feels through the word. When God speaks the word and applies the word, comes down to him with the word, and he responds in prayer and praise and glory. There's a supping. There's a fellowshipping. There's a mealtime together together then we become spiritual ruse that sit at the table and are fed by the greater Boaz, and we rejoice with joy unspeakable. And the fruit of it, of course, is that we're not lukewarm, but we then rejoice, and we say with Jesus himself, my meat is to do the will of my Father in heaven and to finish his work. Then we are brought into the intimacy of communion, and we want to spend the rest of our lives doing the will of God. Behold, dear believer, he stands at the door and knocks this morning. Some of you are backslidden. 
Some of you are far from this communion. He calls you this morning. Repent afresh. Be zealous. Return. He will sup with you. And you with him. That's what life is all about. That's true living. That's true joy. That's true communion. That's so far above anything this world can give you. You can't begin to compare the two. But then I think there's also a way in which this knocking of Jesus doesn't only come to the corporate church as a whole or to individual believers in the church, but also to nominal members of the church that have never yet been saved. And many commentaries forget this, that there are nominal members within the church of Laodicea, no doubt, who are not born again. And the knock comes to them too. Not that they have the ability in themselves to open the door. Of course not. This is not the point here to talk about that kind of theology. But the invitation to come to the gospel grace of God is what's at stake. And therefore the knocking comes to every man who hears the gospel. And my dear friend, if you remain unconverted until the judgment day, till the day of your death, the knockings of God upon your conscience through his word by his law, by his gospel, will be your agony in hell forever. Our greatest sin in hell, we will realize, is the rejection of a knocking Savior. That we have said all our lifetime, be it through our theology or through our religiosity or through our worldliness, I have no desire to have this man, this king, Jesus, rule over me. That's why our forefathers always said that the center of hell, the hell of hell, the hottest furnace in hell, if you will, is reserved for those who have heard the gospel and rejected it. Puritan Thomas Brooks said, the heathen who have never heard shall be thrust onto the surface of hell, but the ungodly who have heard it and rejected it shall be thrust into the heart of hell. It's a solemn thing, a solemn thing to be, to be presented with the remedy through a knocking Jesus and turn that knocker away. Well, what are we to do then? Where are we to go from here? How can we bring him back to the church and to individual believers and to nominal sinners if he's not in the preaching, if he's not in the prayer meeting, if he's not with us when we read our Bibles and pray, and how do we bring him back? Well, the first thing we have to face up to is the reason for his absence. We need to understand that our self-sufficiency pushes Jesus out of the church. It disgusts him. Our lukewarmness He despises. When we go to a prayer meeting, and we've got 75 people there out of a congregation of 750, Jesus is disgusted. When we go to a conference, in which for two days, we've all known for a whole year when those days are, and people come from all over the country and the world And we can't bother to come five minutes to hear about our Savior and our glorious Father. Some of us couldn't even show up for one session out of the ten. Couldn't be bothered to hear these wonderful preachers coming from around the globe. Something's wrong. 
It's disturbing. Now, it's not saying that if you come to a conference, if you come to a prayer meeting, that solves the problem. That's just the external. Where is the hunger? Where is the zeal? Is Jesus Christ number one in your soul? And if he is, why aren't you living like that? And why can't your neighbor see it and your spouse and your children and your parents and your work associates? Or could it be that deep in our hearts, and I include myself in this as much as you, that deep in our hearts we are saying to ourselves, I'm increased with spiritual goods and I have need of nothing. I come to church every week. Oh yes, I don't miss the morning service, the evening service. I go through the forms of religion. But don't ask me to do anything extra. I want to be lukewarm. Our lives betray us. You see, what Jesus says is the way to healing is first to be honest with yourself. And ask yourself questions. Why don't I bother to show up two times a month for one hour to a prayer meeting? Why why don't I do that? And stop covering up your excuses. When God honors prayer meetings, and we know that from church history, brings revival through these things many, many times. Don't try to cover it up. There's something you need to think about. Why is this? Why is the Bible so cold when I open it up, or so it seems to me? Why am I not even searching the scriptures for 10 minutes a day? Oh, I read a few verses. But why don't I study it? Why don't I meditate on it? What what is wrong with me? Stop covering up, Jesus says. Recognize you're poor and blind and naked. Something's wrong. No cover-up, no Watergate, no self-justification, no excuses before God. Stop excusing yourself, Laodicea. And repent and return. And secondly, be willing to be disciplined. Don't just face up to the reason for Christ's absence but be willing to be disciplined. As many as I love, verse 19 says, I rebuke and chasten. It's his love that he's rebuking you, even right now. No minister loves to rebuke a church, I'll tell you that. Run away from it. But through his servants, we're called to rebuke each other. We're called to admonish each other. We're called to challenge each other, to be iron sharpening iron. We're called to encourage each other, call each other to a life of zeal, a life of passion for the glory of God. And so when Christ withdraws himself, it's a loving withdrawal. It's a disciplinary withdrawal. He withdraws himself because he wants you to wake up. He wants you to say, what's wrong? Now I'm not saying that when you feel that Christ is distant from you and Christ is withdrawn from you, stands on the outside of your home, as it were, knocking on your door, that you should then draw the conclusion automatically, well, I'm not a Christian at all. No, every believer has times of spiritual lapse and various degrees of backsliding. But we should understand that is serious and disgusting to Jesus. And if we love him, we want to please him. We don't want him to be disgusted with us. And he knocks out of love, you see. He says, as many as I love, I do this kind of thing to. I rebuke, I chasten. So don't let the devil tell you that you're not a Christian just because from time to time you grow spiritually cold and Christ grows distant. But hear the voice of Christ this morning. He wants to come into your heart with a greater fullness and freeness. He wants you to trust him wholeheartedly, to live unto him wholeheartedly. He wants to kick away all the props from underneath your 
your lukewarmness, all the things you're involved in, all the things that are keeping you busy, all the things that are tripping you up in your spiritual pilgrimage. He wants to do away with those things. He wants you to come to Jesus to see him and to love him and to serve him and to be zealous for him. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's the message of verse 19. And literally, the word zealous there means be boiling hot. Be on fire for Jesus and for his glory. That's what the church needs today. Beginning with the ministers, the elders, the deacons, but also the lay people. What was it in the 18th century when the church was lukewarm and disgusting in the mouth of Christ? What was it that, that brought life into the church? Was it the writings of people like Butler and Haley with their demonstrations and proofs about the existence of God? Of course not. It was George Whitfield, on fire with God's spirit, that raised the temperature of the church by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God through men and women of God who are on fire for God. Be zealous and repent. And finally, the remedy is not only to buy of Christ and to respond to Christ, but also to plead upon Christ. Verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. What a glorious thing this is. To him that overcometh. You see, that Christ should come and sit and sup with his people is honor enough but that he should wish to humble them and then lead them to crown them in glory and to espouse them to himself with eternal espouses of love and authority and to change them from paupers into princes and to crown them and to throne them to rule in authority with him, this surpasses all understanding. This is glorious, beautiful, unfathomable, sovereign grace. And here at the very end of these seven letters, to the churches of Asia. We come to the apex of all the promises of God. You, dear believer, as you walk in this life and by the grace of the Holy Spirit are made zealous for Christ and live for him and want to die for him and enter into glory in his name, you shall receive a throne. A throne is a symbol of conquest. A throne is a symbol of authority. A throne is a symbol of performing tasks and giving out orders to administer what that throne is exactly and how we'll administer authority, we don't know. But his people, made zealous for his name, shall be full of uninterrupted zeal with no backsliding in the great day, and they shall sit and reign in authority with him on thrones. What a promise. What a prospect of glory to rule and to reign with Christ. But you see, if we're going to help Christ exercise his lordship and glory, we need to know what it means to be brought under his lordship here and now so that we are ripened for that position of authority hereafter. And the interesting thing is that you notice how Jesus puts this. He, he says this, as I share the Father's throne, true believer, so you shall share my throne. And I say this with certainty. Remember my name is amen. My word is true. I'm the true and faithful witness. You have a glorious future. By the grace of God, you are saved only through my blood. But that blood produces fruits of sanctification and zeal. And though you stumble here below, and though you have to grieve over your own lukewarmness so many times, I will bring you, as zealous Christians, to that eternity where you will be purely zealous forever. Hear the Spirit of Christ. He that hath an ear, 
let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Will you hear this morning the warning against lukewarmness? Will you understand the seriousness of it? The judgment day is coming. Don't appear before God as a lukewarm, nominal Christian. God's own truths will condemn you. You must be born again. What eventually happened to Laodicea, I don't know. But very soon, very soon it ceased to to exist as a church. Were there those among them who heard this letter read and repented and are now seated around the throne of Christ? No doubt. No doubt. Are there those sitting here this morning who've heard this letter read and will get serious about it and will repent and will one day sit around the throne of Christ? Bring your needs to him. Say to him, I'm not rich. I'm selfish. I'm self-complacent. I'm lukewarm. I'm poor. I'm blind. I'm miserable. I'm wretched. I'm naked. Give me eyesight. Give me white raiment. Give me gold tried in the fire. He'll delight to do it. His market of free grace is still open. But don't delay. He's ready to spew you out of his mouth. Hear him today before it's too late. Seek him today. Call upon him today. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let him turn unto God, for he will abundantly pardon. I counsel you to buy of Jesus Christ today. Amen. Great God of heaven, please bless this word. Oh, we are so guilty, Lord, of taking for granted the glorious, glorious truths of the gospel, even the blood of thy Son. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our lukewarmness. Humble us. Bring us to repentance. Make us zealous. Send thy Spirit. Oh, God, lead us to that point. For we must cry out for thy eyesav and thy white garment and thy gold tried in the fire. Please go with us further this day and bless our congregation. Lord, we thank thee for the zeal, the true godly zeal that is among us. But we are disturbed. We are grieved that so many are so lukewarm. And Lord, may we not be among them, but fill us with godly zeal for godly truth and for thy Son. Lord, may we truly hear what the Spirit has to say to our church this morning. And may it make an eternal difference. By thy grace, and by thy spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.